Good afternoon uh, to each and every one of you. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Peter Lowen. I'm the Associate Director at the schwartz Reisman Institute for Science and Technology. I'm also the Director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and the Director of the uh, Policy Elections and Representation Lab, and I'm a Professor of Political Science. Enough about me. Um, before we begin today, I do want to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. Um, it has been for thousands of years the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And today we're very, very lucky. Uh, we should feel very fortunate to be able to live and to work and to play, and indeed to be together on this piece of Turtle Island. Um, a few logistics before we begin. The, today's talk is, is being recorded. Um, Talia, our, our guest, is going to speak for about 50 minutes, followed by our usual Q&A. And during the Q&A portion of the function, uh, function of the uh, portion of the of the event, uh, I encourage you to use a Q&A function to uh, to raise your to raise your questions. Talia has indicated that um, clarifying questions are okay during the talk, but otherwise we're going to leave them um, to the end. So I'll keep an eye out for hands. Um, okay, with all that, it's my real pleasure to introduce Talia Gillis, who's joining us today um, from Columbia University, where she's an associate professor and the handler, uh, the Milton Handler Fellow at uh, the law school there. Um, she studies the law and economics of consumer markets and is interested in household financial behavior, um, how consumer welfare is shaped by technological and legal changes. And in her research, she's studied the impact of regulatory tools such as financial disclosures and fiduciary duties on consumer welfare. She empirically studies the way households manage their financial debts, um, their ebbs and flows, and how they engage in mental um, accounting. And some of her recent work um, in, considers how artificial intelligence and consumer fintech more broadly is affecting consumers and raising distributional concerns. Her paper, recent paper, The Input Fallacy, was the winner of the uh, 2022 AALS Scholarly Papers Competition. She's a recipient of a 2022 Junior Faculty Grant and the Richard Paul Richmond, uh, at, sorry, at the Richard Paul Richmond Center for Business Law and Public Policy. Uh, and uh, just final few little uh, pieces of biographical information. She joined Columbia in 22 after competing in SJD at Harvard and pursuing a PhD in economics. And at Harvard, she was a John M. Olin Fellow in, the, in Empirical Law and Finance, a Terrence M. Um, um, Considine Fellow in Law and Economics, and a Program on Negotiations Fellow. And she clerked notably for the Deputy Chief Justice of the uh, Israeli Supreme Court, Hannon Melser. Um, so without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming our very distinguished guest, uh, who's going to enlighten us very, very much for the next uh, 90 minutes or so, uh, Talia Gillis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you for the opportunity to present some of my, um, my ongoing work. I'm just going to share um, my slides. Um, so uh, this is joint work with uh, Jan Spies and uh, Bryce McLaughlin, in which we consider how properties of machine predictions affect resulting human decisions. So um, as there's an increased use of algorithms and decision-making in critical domains, capturing the benefits um, of increased accuracy while making sure decisions are fair and non-discriminatory is a key concern. And so consider the, the domain of consumer finance, which a lot of my work has uh, focused on, uh, where there have been several examples of claims of discriminatory algorithms. One um, salient example uh, was with Apple Card. So Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs uses essentially big data to set highly personalized credit terms. And this card was the center of attention in August 2019, when a husband received 20 times the credit limit of his wife, despite them having similar assets and the wife's, in fact, higher credit score. And so this prompted an investigation by the New York Department of Financial Services, which ultimately concluded that the algorithm was not discriminatory. But what is central is that the claim and investigation focused on this presumably black box algorithm that was determining credit card terms and whether it was fair in that provided different terms for individuals who had similar credit scores but were of different genders. But when we think about fairness in this context, we need to pay attention to how an algorithmic decision is applied. So one way an algorithmic prediction is applied is by directly translating the prediction into a decision. So suppose Apple Card trained a model to predict borrowed credit worthiness, and so then there was a, when there's a new applicant, their individual features are then translated directly into a decision with respect to that borrower's credit limit. We call this automation. And a significant part of the algorithmic fairness literature and much of the legal and policy literature focuses either explicitly or implicitly on analyzing a prediction when an algorithm implements a decision directly. But in many critical applications, we see a very different model in which a prediction is given to a human decision maker that has decision-making authority. 
So for example, suppose that Apple Card's algorithmic recommendation, like a prediction of credit worthiness, could be provided to an Apple Card employee who then decides the credit limit. We call this assistance. And this model of decision-making in which the algorithm acts as an aid to a human decision-maker is prevalent in many critical decision-making domains, such as employment and bail decisions, and is often mandated by legal rules. And so what we do in this paper is we compare some of the results of the algorithmic fairness literature to the counterpart in a decision system where a human decision maker takes the prediction as an input. So I'll start with what I see as our contributions and key insights. So what we do is we compare, to, compare two very simple algorithms. These are essentially conditional averages, which are varied based on whether they use a protected characteristic focusing on gender to inform some prediction. And we later extend this analysis to consider more generally the implications of excluding or including variables when forming the conditional average. So for example, we compare conditional averages that vary on whether they use a, uh, a characteristic that's correlated with a protected characteristic. So you can think of it, this like a, like a proxy. Um, then we have our data, uh, which is used for the prediction. And then the prediction is either automatically translated into a decision or is given to a human decision maker. And we have two main metrics of interest. For fairness, we, we uh, think about the expected differences in decisions across gender. Um, we can also consider kind of holding all other features consistent. Um, so think of X as a large uh, a covariance as a kind of a conditional disparity. And our metric um, for, fair, for accuracy, which is the expected mean square error of the decision. And so we compare these two metrics um, uh, when we include and exclude the protected characteristics or variables that correlate with protected characteristics in the two structures of decision. So automation, when the decision itself is the conditional average or is, is a conditional average, and with assistance, when the decision is determined by a human who has some prior beliefs seeking to maximize accuracy after seeing the conditional average. So in our setup, we have the same prediction algorithm, but we have a human that decides what to do with the prediction. And our key insight is that the usual trade-off between accuracy and fairness may revert. And specifically, with automation, using gender or a correlated variable to form a conditional average increases disparity, simply because it allows for the direct differentiation uh, based on gender. And this is kind of the classic trade-off uh, between accuracy and fairness. But under assistance, the causal effect of including gender or a correlated variable completely depends on who is getting the signal. And to demonstrate this, we focus on a context of a decision maker with biased beliefs. So in such a case, the use of gender and the conditional average can decrease disparity, creating alignment between risk minimization and fairness. And so just to clarify, we're not arguing that including protected characteristics always reduces disparity. Rather, it can because decision outcomes depend on who receives the signal and makes a decision. And perhaps some kind of, um, to provide an example of, of some kind of suggestive evidence that implementation of algorithmic prediction makes a difference, particularly for fairness outcomes. So this is from a recent paper by Enz Ludwig and Sandal Melanathan, which discusses a, a New York City pre-trial release tool used for bail decisions by judges. And so the older tool um, recommended the release of white defendants at a much higher rate than black defendants. So New York City essentially teamed up with uh, the University of Chicago Crime Lab leading to a tool that recommended um, similar and, and kind of higher release rates for black and white defendants. So this kind of meets the, the fairly stringent definition of statistical parity. But we can see kind of in the, in, the, uh, in the third column that when these scores are then used by judges, we have lower release rates overall, but we also have a, a significant racial gap in release rates. And so what this does is it suggests that in the context of assistance, this idea when an algorithm is, is, is used uh, by a human decision maker, we can be hyper-focused on the properties of the algorithm itself. But the optimal design of the algorithm depends on how it's used by humans. So if judges have biased priors, for example, they believe that Black defendants are more likely, uh, are less likely to appear to court, um, if, this, if the score doesn't include race, judges might be using their biased prior combined with the risk score that they're receiving in making a decision. Um, so our analysis builds on a very large literature of algorithmic fairness, much of which focuses, as I mentioned, on a decision structure of automation. 
but we highlight how properties of the underlying prediction affect the, um, affect the decision and that doesn't translate directly in the context of assistance. Uh, we therefore focus on the centrality of the implementation to the question of algorithmic design. We also provide kind of one more reason to be skeptical about a blanket approach to excluding protected characteristics in their proxies, which is quite prevalent in legal and policy writings. And we look to test the predictions of our theory using a machine, uh, a human machine lab experiment. Okay, so just to give you kind of an outline of what I'll be talking about, I'll start off with how this distinction between automation and assistance is important because one dominant emerging approach to the regulation of AI is requiring human oversight. I'll then talk a little bit more about the setup and the model that we study, focusing on a stylized example. Um, and I'll talk about the implications of excluding a protected characteristic from the conditional average and excluding a variable that's correlated with a protected characteristic, so like a proxy from the conditional average. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about the experiment that we've been working on to test predictions of the model. I should mention that we um, received the, uh, the data for this experiment just over a week ago. So the results are really, um, really, really preliminary. And so I'm excited to share them and, and get your thoughts on, on, on that as well. Okay, so starting off with um, the legal limits on automation. So human oversight on algorithmic decisions or the requirement of retaining human decision-making authority is not only what we see often seen in practice in critical applications, but it's increasingly considered a pillar of AI regulation. Um, perhaps the most salient recent example is the EU proposed regulation of AI circulated in April uh, last year, which is kind of an attempt to provide a regulatory framework across domains. So um, although it's only a proposal, in many ways it has already set the agenda for many of discussions around the regulation of AI. And Article 14 of the proposal requires human oversight in high-risk domains. And Section 4 tells us that human oversight means that a human should be able to decide to not use high-risk, not use the high-risk AI system, disregard, override, or reverse the output. We have other examples. So, for example, the GDPR already has this aversion to fully automated decisions. Article 22 of the GDPR. Um, allows individuals not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing, so kind of no automated uh, decision making. Um, the Loomis decision in the US, the idea that there might be a, a due process right uh, to a human decision is often associated with the, with the Loomis decision, it was essentially a, a case that challenged the use of compass risk assessment tools used for sentencing. Um, another example of a kind of a concrete example of legislation to this effect in the US can be seen, can be seen in the Washington uh, Facial Recognition Law, which requires meaningful human review, which is essentially the ability to retain human uh, decision-making authority. Okay, so moving on a little bit of, of our kind of setup and model. So in our setup, um, the task is essentially to use individuals' um, ex-observable covariates and their protected characteristic gender to make a prediction decision, where the goal is a decision that when measured against the true label minimize expected mean square error. That's our kind of our loss function. Um, and so if we think about this, for example, in the credit uh, context, say you were predicting a uh, default on a loan. So we might have information about uh, an individual's income, their wealth, their credit score, their gender. And uh, we wanna make a pr prediction that essentially uh, minimizes the mean square error between the predicted default and the true default. Um, we have access to some training data, so you can think of this uh, in my example as past borrowers. And we have two prediction algorithms. We have a conditional average um, without gender that only looks um, at the conditional average based on uh, the other covariates, the X covariates, and a conditional average that uses gender in addition uh, to the other covariates. And so what we assume is that there's a structure in which there's some kind of training data that's used then by the machine to create a prediction function, which a human decision maker having access to the prediction then kind of makes a, a decision. And we make several assumptions about the decision maker. So the decision maker essentially has prior beliefs and takes a decision to minimize expected loss given the conditional average. So a few of those key assumptions are that we uh, assume that the human observes gender, so that's something that they can see. Um, we assume that the human has access to the training data only through the conditional average that they receive, kind of the, the, the algorithm, and that there's no misalignment in preferences because the human decision maker is also seeking to minimize loss. Um, 
We also assume that there may be actual differences across groups. So there could be true differences across men and women. Um, and there could be differences in the expectation of the prior for men and women. But for the rest of the talk, I'll assume that the differences in beliefs are greater than the true differences. So that means we're considering the case in which the priors are specified. So the beliefs in that difference, the individual's prior, the human decision making prior, um, are greater than the true uh, differences um, in the data. Our two properties of interest are, first of all, the decision accuracy. So in, in automation, that will simply be the expected mean error, square error comparing the true label to the prediction. In assistance, it's going to be the difference between the true label and the decision. And the decision disparities, meaning the differences um, in decision for men and women, or kind of the conditional uh, disparities, so that's controlling for covariates, either looking at the disparities of the prediction function itself or with assistance, the disparities of the decision. Um, and so um, I'll now use a uh, kind of a highly stylized example just to kind of build the intuition for our results. So I want you to assume that there's only one type of X characteristic, so that all that distinguishes people is their gender. And assume that people are roughly half female, half male, and that the data and prize are normally distributed. So even though the true means can be distinct for men and women, we assume that the difference in priors is greater than the true differences, difference in means. Now, before going back to the human decision, let's consider the prediction uh, of the algorithm. So we consider two different ways of forming a prediction, one that uh, does not include gender in the prediction and one that does include gender in the prediction. So if we were to use these predictions directly, we would trivially find that allowing the use of gender in the prediction function essentially allows the decision to change on the basis of gender. So the use of gender may increase accuracy, but also increase disparities. And this, again, this is the classic trade-off between accuracy and disparities. But what we, what we wanna consider now is not what's, what happens when the algorithm is directly, is applied directly, but when it's used as a signal for a human decision maker. So now the decision maker is given the conditional average, which they combine with their prior to create a posterior expectation. So what happens when the conditional average does not include gender? So these are the decision uh, makers' beliefs of the distribution of default probability for, for men and women. And those kind of vertical lines are the expectation of the prior for men and women. So without any signal, this would be the decision, these vertical lines for men and women, uh, because the human has access to gender, they can make a decision that varies on the basis of gender. Now, suppose they have access to a conditional average uh, without gender. So the average of the default probabilities for the full population. In this example, it's lower than the prior average. This will lead to a decision that is shifted in the same way for men and women. But the signal does not create any knowledge with respect to the difference between men and women. The gap in the means remains the same. Intuitively, the decision maker only updates with respect to the combined average but not the differences in average. Now what happens when you combine, when you provide a signal that has gender? So again, these are the decision makers beliefs, men and women. And now the human decision maker receives separate signals for men and women. This will lead to a shift in the posteriors for men and women, and they both shift in the respective direction of the conditional average. So in this example, I'm assuming that the prior um, of the differences in means is larger than the two differences. So by having the separate means, the decision for men and women become closer to one another. So this idea of kind of you're countering the bias through presenting information that includes gender. Now, just to summarize the result kind of more generally, assuming that outcomes are normally distributed with some unknown mean mu and the human has some prior over the mean mu, um, which is also uh, distributed normally and is independent across X and J, X and, and gender, sorry, um, the human decision maker, after receiving the signal of the overall average, meaning it does not depend on G, has disparities, which are just the difference in the prior means, right? Um, because it's not receiving any information about that difference. Um, so the priors are just uh, um, are just the different in the prior means. However, the resulting disparities are different when the human receives a signal, which is an average that depends on gender. In this case, uh, the disparity um, of the resulting decision is a weighted average of the prior and the data. So the differences in the in, in signal. And the weight 
depends on the precision of the signal relative to the precision um, of the prior. And you, so you can see that as a sample goes, sample size for that the, uh, the, the algorithm has access to goes to infinity, the weight on the signal becomes larger. And so the sample size going to infinity also means that the empirical difference between men and women become the true differences, uh, the empirical true differences. Um, in the paper, we um, kind of uh, provide a, the uh, results for general priors, not just normal priors. So uh, in the debate paper, we discuss how um, under general conditions, assuming that there's some baseline disparity, so differences in the average outcome of men and women, and de um, delta disparate beliefs, meaning that prior beliefs about the disparities uh, a larger than uh, than delta than the true difference in the data, meaning no matter what I learn about the average, I, I still believe that there's disparities. Uh, essentially, this is the idea that the prize are misspecified. Then for large samples under automation, the output of the algorithm has the following relationship. So higher disparities when we include gender and higher precision with gender, the trade-off between disparity and precision. However, when assisting a human decision maker with bias beliefs, an algorithm with access to gender can lead to a decision with lower disparities and higher precision, so that providing conditional average with gender dominates in both disparity and precision in the case of assistance. Um, and as I mentioned, we've, uh, we've also kind of uh, extended this uh, to think about correlated features. So many current policy discussions are not so much about whether to include a protected characteristic, which is sometimes considered illegal, um, Instead, many current policy uh, discussions are about excluding individual covariates beyond the protected uh, characteristic themselves, such as covariates that are correlated with the protected characteristic, which are kind of often referred to um, as proxies. So um, what we do is we consider an additional covariate beyond the variables uh, we have conditioned on uh, for disparity purposes, and we ask uh, whether we'd want to include it or exclude that additional uh, covariate. And so we're going to consider a binary uh, covariate, um, we'll call it Z. I finally feel at home <laughs> that I can call it Z instead of Z. So we're going to consider a binary covariate Z uh, that's correlated with gender by the co coefficient rel. Um, and we're going to make similar assumptions as we made before. Now let's consider the disparities of the human decision a decisions assisted by a conditional average with and without Z, the correlated variable. So when the human um, uh, takes a decision based on a conditional average, which excludes Z, then the disparities of the resulting decisions is simply the prior beliefs of the difference between men and women. Now let's consider what happens when you take, when the, uh, the human takes a decision based on a conditional average that includes Z. So it also, uh, does, it doesn't have gender, but in addition, it doesn't include this um, additional variable that's correlated. Now, if Z and, and G and gender are, are not correlated at all, then including Z will make no differences for disparities. If they're perfectly correlated, Z and, uh, and gender and G, um, then we simply get the result we got before. It's the same as including or excluding G. Um, but for any correlation in between kind of not being correlated at all and being fully correlated, um, essentially this formula um, uh, tells us the impact um, on disparities. And so the result, the disparities of the resulting decisions um, is the prior disparities um, and an adjusted term that essentially consists of two parts. So that second part there relates uh, the covariate Z to the surprise, meaning the difference between the predictions and what the decision maker had expected. And that first part in gray essentially is about the strength of the signal and the correlation between Z and group um, um, identity. But what's essential is that the, the basic result is similar in terms of kind of the the uh, the use of the prior in in update the use of the prior when receiving the signal um, and the effect it has on the resulting disparities. Okay, so that's um, kind of uh, we'll summarize the, the basics of kind of our model uh, and our setup and our model. Um, but I want to kind of use uh, the time I have left to to tell you a bit about this experiment we've been working on and some of kind of the preliminary results um, that we've had so far. So. Our theory suggests that the interaction of human beliefs and algorithmic design affects the accuracy and fairness of decisions. And specifically, uh, when there is a biased human decision maker providing information about gender, for example, could result in decisions with more disparity. 
And so we ask, how does providing algorithmic decision aids that use protected characteristics affect the disparities and accuracy of the resulting decisions? So what we're going to do is we're going to ask participants to guess a test score of test takers. And to help with this evaluation or prediction, we're going to provide evaluators, these are the participants in the experiments, um, with a conditional average. Um, and treatments will vary according to what the average is conditioned on. So whether it includes gender or not, whether it's conditioning um, over a group of, of test takers um, that are narrowed down by kind of their gender or kind of men and women aggregated. And the experiment was pre-registered, so you can check that out if you um, if you want to have a look at that. Okay, so um, what essentially we're looking for is a test in which we think that beliefs about gender disparities are greater than the true disparities. That's the idea that we want these biased beliefs, that the beliefs that that uh, that the gaps are, are larger than they are in reality. And we think, based on prior work, that this might be true for math tests um, of kind of how women do relative to men. Um, in math tests. And so um, we focus on math scores that were obtained from researchers. This is Tammy Crickley Katz and Cecilia Ridgway that um, collected this data for kind of a completely unrelated project, um, but which we then use their data for our purposes. So um, this was a test, a math test that um, was administered on MTurk, um, which included six math questions. And you can see kind of two examples of those math questions. Um, and here are just some kind of summary statistics on, on the results of, of the participants who took this math test. Um, so there were 396 participants. Um, additional information was collected uh, beyond their, their score, such as age, education, race, and income. Um, and we have kind of uh, here on the right, we, we've um, kind of broken down the results by uh, uh, level of education and age. So kind of the top um, is, were participants um, with a four-year uh, college degree. And um, at the bottom, we have participants who don't have a college degree, a four-year college degree. And on the left, we have kind of young participants um, kind of below age 45 and the young at heart, which is above age 45. Um, and so you can see overall that, that women um, uh, kind of have higher scores uh, have overall in, in nearly all cells they have higher scores than the men in this experiment okay and so in the experiment so this is the data we're going to use as our kind of our training set that we're going to uh then give our evaluators to predict scores so in our main experiment participants essentially will guess the test score receiving two types of information First of all, they'll receive information about the particular test taker for which they're guessing the score including their gender and they'll receive information about the average score of other participants, which we'll call an assistant. Okay, this, con this conditional average will be the assistant they get in predicting uh, the math score. And then treatments will vary by over which population that average is calculated. So you can see we, we vary whether kind of that average is calculated um, all participants, participants within a certain age group, uh, level of education, and kind of whether it um, the conditional average is calculated um, over a particular gender or not. Um, and so um, here you can see kind of um, the example for two, two treatment conditions. So, so both in the first treatment condition and the second, um, the, the participants are receiving the same information, the same profile about the participants. So subject 322, his age is between 50 and 55 years old, and he has a four-year college degree. So both treatments are assisting that, are receiving that same in profile, but these treatments vary on what the, what the information they're getting from the assistant. So the first is getting an assistant that's calculated for men and women over the age of 45, whereas the second is kind of calculated, is giving, providing the mean um, for just men over the age um, of, of 45. Um, and I'll just mention that it was an incentivized um, experiment in terms of kind of um, uh, guessing or evaluating or predicting uh, the uh, the scores. Okay, so what I'll I'll show now is kind of um, is very very uh, preliminary. Um, as I said, we just kind of got the results and we've got a lot more to do. Um, but what we have here is essentially what I'm going to show is um, uh, the weighted results from the experiment. 
um, meaning that we weighted estimates by how representative they were in the true population. And by the true population, we mean the full math uh, test sample. And that's going to matter because educated women were disproportionately represented in the experiment profiles relative to kind of the test taker uh, profiles. So women were kind of overall less educated in terms of uh, the participants in the uh, test scores in, 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 the, in the test uh, in the math tests. Um, but were overrepresented in the profiles that we showed um, participants in our experiment. So this is the the uh, the weighted results. Um, and so um, um, focusing on that kind of blue and that horizontal blue line. So that blue line uh, plots the differences in estimates for men uh, and women. This is women uh, minus men. So if it's kind of on the on the left side, that means that the uh, predictions, the average predictions for men were, were higher than the average prediction for women. Um, and uh, we can see in the first line when we provide an assistant that doesn't distinguish on the basis of gender, okay, so or th these are people who just received kind of the average for men and women um, is X, um, but people estimate that women do worse than men. But if we provide an assistant that averages over gender separately, that's kind of the lower line, um, then we can see that there's uh, no gender disparity in estimates. Okay, and you can see in that, um, but note that those the green line is giving us the true disparities between men and women. So as I mentioned before, women actually um, uh, um, perform better than men on the on the math test. And that red line is giving us the disparities in the average score given to participants. Um, and we can separate this by um, by in, into other treatment conditions. So as I mentioned, we also vary whether you, you receive um, an average condition that conditions on just one X covariate age or two X covariates age and education. Um, but we see kind of similar patterns there. There's quite a bit more to be done, uh, analysis to be done. Um, so for example, we're very interested in um, fitting a model of, or a Bayesian model for updating to really understand how priors are updated using the signals. That's, this is something we're able to do um, given the questions we asked our participants. Um, we're also very interested in um, kind of uh, analyzing based on, on uh, particular subgroups of participants. So we asked people about their age gender and education after they had completed the experiment. So we should be able to kind of pass out whether there's kind of any uh, type of in-group bias with respect to these estimates. And so that's kind of our next step uh, in that respect. Um, we also randomize the order of uh, the different profiles that were evaluated. And so, um, and so we're quite uh, interested in kind of analyzing the answers in the early stage. So, so each participant, I forgot to mention, um, I did 12 profiles, not a, not a huge amount, but still enough probably to get bored at some point. And so um, we are interested in kind of whether there's any kind of variation in answers given kind of early, early on versus later on. Perhaps uh, people get tired of kind of thinking carefully about the profile they're receiving and just uh, put the estimate that's given by the assistant um, as the experiment progresses. And that's something that we hope to, to analyze too. Um, for our next steps, um, one of the things that we think came out of the experiment is that perhaps uh, our gender cue is a little too subtle. Uh, we wanted to avoid a situation where it was kind of very much in participants' face that um, we, we were thinking about gender men versus women. And, and you may recall that when we provided profiles, we use kind of his or her um, um, as opposed to kind of directly providing gender. Um, and, um, and we're interested in whether it would make a difference whether that uh, gender cue was, was stronger. Um, and we're, um, we're, so in this experiment, um, we just kind of um, evaluate or calculate the averages, but uh, we haven't put in any thought into how you could potentially de-bias um, evaluators. If, for example, we provided them information about typical mistakes people make, rather than just kind of using the same prediction function, just giving them the prediction of test scores. And so we're interested in, in considering different methods of debiasing uh, beyond what was done in this experiment. Um, okay, so so maybe I'll uh, I'll conclude um, so um, I can hear kind of your, your thoughts and questions. Um, so what we do in this paper is essentially we consider how the decision-making structure impacts the relationship between the design of an algorithm and the resulting properties of a decision. And what we do is we build a model in which the algorithmic prediction can be either implemented directly 
um, or is used as, as a decision aid to a human decision maker. Um, focusing on a particular context, uh, we show that the inclusion of a biased human decision maker can revert common relationships between the structure of the algorithm and the qualities of the resulting decisions. And specifically, we show that when we, when directly implementing an algorithmic decision that considers gender or a proxy, we have a trade-off between accuracy and disparity as we define disparities. But this relationship can be reverted when an algorithm is used um, as a signal by a human uh, decision maker. And we're working on extending this framework to situations in which group priors are correlated, but also into another few settings that kind of I, uh, I limited that I mentioned that we were kind of assuming away in our setup. So um, you may recall that we're assuming in, uh, in our setup, our current setup, that there's no misalignment in preferences between the decision maker and the kind of the algorithm designer, right? They both are trying to minimize mean square error. Um, uh, but we can you can imagine a situation in which the uh, there's misaligned preferences between the human decision maker um, and the, the the social planner or the algorithm designer. Uh, we also want to consider situations in which um, uh, conditional averages rely on inaccurate inaccurate data. That might be particularly true in the context in which I study uh, credit decisions in which you have kind of label bias. Um, we have kind of assumed that, that away in this context, we assume that uh, we don't have um, inaccurate data. And we'd like to extend it to when dealing with kind of binary decisions. Um, at the moment, it's, it's uh, focused on continuous decisions. And so the purpose of the paper um, is not to say that we should always include protected characteristics in an algorithm, but rather we should not consider the algorithm itself as the be all and end all of a decision. So when we consider the impact of an algorithm, we have to be sensitive to how it's going to be implemented. So we can think of a human and an algorithm as a game of catch. So we've been very focused on how the ball is thrown, but the way you throw a ball may depend on who you're throwing it to, and it should be based on the human receiver. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there, and I um, I'm really excited to to hear your thoughts and questions. Well, thank you very very much, Taya. Um, I'm looking forward to questions. If anyone wants to put up their uh, use the raise hand function, um, I'll go right to you. Uh, I'll go right to you for questions. Okay, Alexander Bernier, please. Sure. So thanks so much for a great talk. It made me think a little bit of some work I had been involved in a long time ago uh, that was looking at basically the regulation of clinical decision support systems, um, specifically in, in hospital contexts, where you were sort of looking at two kinds of risks. So you have this sort of risk that, you know, whatever AI you, you implemented would itself be biased. And then you also have the risk of, you know, as you'd suggested, actually it's the individual user of the AI that's going to bring their own bias into the, um, you know, the application, the implementation of the score. Um, what I was wondering is, what do you see in terms of long-term, um, I guess, satisfactory, you know, regulatory approaches to you know, addressing both of those risks at the same time. I know there's been some work looking at things like transparency on the one hand, experimentation for context in which transparency um, you know, doesn't work, process requirements. Like there's been a lot of solutions suggested. So yeah, I'd, I'd be really curious to, to hear your take. And yeah, thanks for a, a lovely talk. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I think the medical context is, is really a great example of um, of a critical domain that um, we're, we're probably always going to see algorithms as used as kind of decision aids versus um, automation. I think um, I think the most urgent and important thing is that when we kind of draft um, regulatory requirements around AI, that um, they're not that they they should not be focused on just on the algorithm. If you're in this kind of decision um, making. Um, setting. So for example, if we think about the EU's proposal, right? So the EU's proposal says kind of you must have human with decision-making authority, but then when it comes to kind of thinking about transparency and auditing and all these other elements, all it does is talk about the algorithm itself, right? The algorithm producer, are they auditing? Are they showing this? Are you showing that your, your data set is, uh, is uh, kind of, it's a very funny expression, like uh, free of errors and, and complete or something like that. But all the regulatory requirements that are associated with the use of algorithms are all essentially just looking at the algorithm in isolation. So I would say the most important thing is if you're going to have a piece of regulation like the, the, the EU proposed rule, then really your auditing, your transparency requirement, everything else should relate to your decision-making system. 
and not to just the, the algorithm itself. Um, and so I think that there's, we're pretty far from kind of actually thinking about what that auditing looks like. We have a lot of um, uh, proposals or ideas of how we audit the algorithm itself, but it's so often in this domain in which that is not the decision itself. And so I think for me, that's, it's not an easy fix, but it's really a necessary fix when we think about kind of the EU proposed rule and other kind of proposals that we've seen circulated, for example, in the US. Thank you very much. Um, Elliot Krieger is next. Um, hi, Talia. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I had a few questions, so Peter cut me off at any time. Um, Thank you very much, Elliot. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> ask, ask as many as you like, please. Yeah. So I guess I was wondering about, in terms of the theory and the analysis there, how the decision maker is modeled. Like I, if I'm understanding things correctly, it's basically like an application of Bayes rule using the prior and also the evidence coming from the the algorithm, which is sort of a, this, as you call it, the conditional um, uh, expectation. Um, I don't know, do you think that's limited in terms of applicability to real world settings? I was also interested in settings like you use in the motivation uh, where a judge might uh, prefer not to use algorithmic input in their decision, right? So the, the bias might may or may not be related to uh, characteristics of the defendant, but it could also be, I just prefer not to use the, um, the algorithm suggestion. Any thoughts you have on that? Yeah, I, so I think that um, your question raises two really important issues. I think the first one, um, it's just related to whether in general we think people um, make decisions according to Bayes' rule. And I think that anyone working on anything related to behavioral economics would say that quite clearly it's not true, right? We have several ways in which actual human decision-making deviates from uh, the assumption of kind of Bayesian updating, whether it's kind of um, base rate and neglect or other behavioral issues. We're actually pretty interested in that. We hope to, um, that's kind of one of the extensions we hope to do is kind of think about the interaction of uh, of kind of well documented behavioral biases um, with the kind of the decision um, making that we're describing. Um, I think it's, that's one really important thing, and that's kind of as I mentioned, also something we we want to look at our experimental results because it's something that we can also test um, whether people are kind of updating in the way we expect them to update. Um, but I think the second element that you talked about with respect to the judges is also a really important one. And I think that's related um, to the fact that there could be this misalignment and preferences between the human decision maker and uh, the algorithm designer. So, um, um, so that would be, and I think your example is great, where the judge, uh, we see um, diverging decisions between the judge's decision and the, the algorithmic recommendation, but that's because the judge just doesn't, it's not trying to achieve kind of uh, the minimization of risk or increase accuracy. It's caring about something completely different. Um, and um, if that's true, then uh, then there's a misalignment of preferences and any divergence is kind of potentially explained by, by some something else. And, um, and we hope at the moment our model doesn't take account of that at all. Um, we are assuming a complete alignment uh, um, in incentives. Um, but um, but I think that but, but that is one of the extensions we want to work on was what happens if there's a misalignment. And obviously we'd have to characterize what exactly that misalignment would look like. So for example, that misalignment could happen perhaps the um, um, perhaps the human decision maker um, a, a benevolent human decision maker maybe just cares about fairness much more than it cares about accuracy. Um, and so there kind of we might have very different results in terms of the optimal uh, design of the algorithm. Um, that also requires, and something we're working on at the moment, is kind of developing more of a kind of a principal agent model um, for, for the setting. So this idea that there's some kind of uh, principal, maybe uh, a, um, a policymaker, decision maker, who is thinking about the optimal design to achieve whatever goal they want, and they're dealing 
with a human decision maker with a misaligned preferences. That's a little bit if you're familiar with kind of the Bayesian persuasion paper, this idea that you might be playing around with what information you provide to achieve some kind of outcome with, with misaligned preferences. Um, so that is something we, we really hope to think about more carefully. Um, I think it, it's going to very much depend on the context, the extent to which um, you think that there are these misaligned preferences. Um, so I think very often um, we might be in a context where there's a human decision maker um, who doesn't necessarily have misaligned preferences. They might have um, private information that it, we might have allocated decision making authority to the human because they have some kind of private information and that's why they're making a decision. Um, and um, you can think of that maybe in, in some credit decisions. Um, there isn't necessarily a misalignment of preferences. I think your example of the judge is definitely one in which we'd be um, somewhat suspicious that that incentives are not completely aligned in the sense that it's not necessarily the judge. Um, all they care about or all they're trying to do is kind of achieve, um, kind of minimize risk and loss. Uh, Christina, okay. oh, sorry. Sorry, yeah, Ellie, did you want to follow up? I could wait. I, maybe I'll wait until the queue kind of empties out and then I'll jump back in. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Christina. Hi, Talia. Great to see you. Love this work. Um, very excited to uh, see where you're going with this. Um, I had a couple of things that came up, I think, in your response uh, to Elliot, and, and maybe he'll follow up on those some more. Uh, so I won't retread that. But um, one thing that strikes me in a lot of these context and may not be straightforward to model, but the mean squared error forces this kind of symmetry on mistakes in either direction. When in real life, we could think about asymmetric costs of error. And I didn't know if you'd had any thoughts on that or if that's popped up in, in your journey with this cool project. Yeah, that's 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 a great question, and and it's obviously um um it's massively important when we think if these are bail decisions or credit decisions, then um you don't potentially observe the outcome if someone doesn't get credit or if someone isn't jailed, and so um and so you definitely have this issue where it's not going to be perfectly symmetric. Uh, your ability to measure the mean square error. Um, is going to itself have, have problems. So we kind of assume that away, but I think in real life applications, that's that's obviously going to be a big, big problem with our with our risk measure. Um, and um, actually, the so um, Jan and, and Bryce have been working on a really nice paper which talks about kind of reference dependence with respect to to algorithmic decisions. So the idea that when a decision maker gets an algorithm, they're not only um, provided information, but they potentially, their, their reference point has changed. So it might be costly, for example, to deviate from a, uh, an algorithmic recommendation. If you're a judge and you get a recommendation, do not release, right? You may think the decision to release um, is associated with higher costs than if your recommendation was released and you decided not to release, particularly because you don't observe that you were wrong if you, um, if you, uh, decide to, to not release. Um, and so um, I think this is another one of those domains in which um, um, we need to put kind of careful thought about when we have the interaction between the algorithm and the human decision maker, what does that look like, particularly with respect to kind of different references and um, kind of whether one type of error is more costly than, than the other. Um, I think that you're also kind of in your question made me think that we should also consider other types of accuracy um, and, and loss, even within the kind of narrow constraints of our model, that perhaps really mean square error is not the only way, and perhaps in many domains is not the right way to think about um, uh, to think about what's being trying to achieve along that um, dimension of, of accuracy um, and precision. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's super helpful. Christina, did you want to follow up, or Elliot, did you want to follow up? I had another question, sure. Please, yeah, um, and I've got one after you, if, the, if no one else gets in the queue, please go ahead. Great. Um, so this question was more about the uh, empirical results with the human participants that you mentioned. So um, I think one of the things that 
is a little bit under discussed in terms of algorithmic fairness is task selection and how we actually define these prediction tasks. It's it's not totally neglected, but it's a big it's a big part of it. Um, so this question, I think, is either going to end up being a sort of a spicy one or will uh, uncover a misunderstanding I have in the experiment or both. But um, I, I understood that the what you're asking the human participants to do is to um, guess a student's score based on some input features. And then you, of course, you can additionally give this signal of the sort of statistical average of the score, I think conditioned on those features, if I understand correctly. And not always. So that's what it's going to vary by which of those features in the profile. Okay. So it'll be a conditional expectation. What you condition on is going to depend. Like it could be, it could have a protected attribute in that conditioning set or not. Yeah. Um, okay. So the question is really like, what are we trying to do with this prediction task? Like it seems a little fishy to me that you would try to guess somebody's score or like, academic aptitude just based on the types of features that you showed on the slide there, like age and other sort of demographic information. Um, it kind of brings up issues around when the, you bring the human participants in, are they really optimizing for mean squared error? Are some of them just maybe they want to be polite or they object to the, the task and just say, you know, this is a this is an old woman, but I don't want to like, you know, rely on my uh, some stereotype to make a judgment about what their score is going to be. I, do you get what I'm kind of getting at here? I, I guess it's a question about selecting the input features. I, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you uh, came up with the task in the first place. Yeah. Um. So. Um. So obviously, for, to be kind of a test of the model, then we we ideally want to be in a situation where there isn't this misalignment of um, incentives. So. Um, the. Uh, the evaluators or the experiment participants are, are trying to minimize uh, the mean square error. Um, the, the way we try to achieve that is by building their incentives um, that way. But um, you correctly point out that that so so we're hoping to, to have a context in which people don't have, um, let's say, let's say they had uh, taste based um, uh, preferences for, for, for men and women um, or, or some kind of other preference. Um, we, we we attempt to cancel that out by structuring an experiment that incentivizes participants in a particular way, but we can't rule out that they are um, they're making decisions. They, the basis for their decisions are, are different. So um, one thing that I'm thinking is when you say that someone perhaps um, so before I talk in a sec about the our selection of features, if you were someone if a participant for example objected to the whole exercise to begin with. Um, do you have um, an intuition as to what you would expect that participant to do? Because what we see is, so, so there's two things a participant might do. The first is not provide an answer, and that would be equivalent. Um, I didn't show you, but the way they respond is they can either put in a number from zero to 100 on the test score, or they have a slider that they can move. And so one of the things they could do is not move the slider at all. Um, and uh, we, we saw one participant do that. Um, so we didn't have many participants do that. The other thing a participant might do is just put in the average um, without, um, without adjusting in any way based on the profile. Um, and I can't actually tell you, I know that, that, um, that the overwhelming number of people don't do that. They don't just adopt the average. Um, but I, I'm, I'm sorry that I can't tell you exactly what percentage. So those would be my two guesses in terms of what we might see from people that that object, are you are you thinking of another possibility or something we might want to look at in terms of identifying this misalignment of preferences? Um, no, not really. I mean, you might have been able to tell from the question it wasn't a very precise thing I had in mind. I, by analogy, in terms of the like criminal justice setting, um, it sounds like what you're asking the participants to do is take the role of the judge, look at basically like the demographic attributes of the defendant and and guess their risk which seem which is would raise a red flag for me so um 
but I, could, yeah. I don't know, maybe that analogy is wrong or. Can I, can I follow on that? Tyler, yeah. Because, because, because I'm trying to figure out what the, what the analogy between predicting the score on a test and predicting a future behavior is um, mm -hmm. where, um, well, there's a whole, there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of features, right? But, but among other things, putting, putting a person in prison changes their likelihood of, of, and the amount of time you put them into a prison and, and the type of one you put them into has all sorts of effects on the likelihood of their of their reoffense, for example, right? Um, which which is something that the judge is also estimating, right? As opposed to just some latent quality of deservedness or something or something like that. So so what's the what what's the real world analogy of test performance in criminal justice? I get what it is in credit scores, but what is it in criminal justice? Um, so, so sorry, this is, so I think you're exactly right. There's a difference between um, what we're doing, which is guessing something that is already true in the world, that's just trying to guess it, versus predicting something that hasn't materialized. Um, but are you asking about how that relates to, so, so the judging, as, as you correctly point out, the judging, uh, the judge uh, example would be one about predicting the future. And so are you imagining that people would behave differently if the task was one of predicting something that happens in the future? It's a slightly more conceptual question than that. I'm just trying to understand exactly what the, I'm trying to understand how broadly you think the construct of, of uh, how broadly you think the construct of, ta of test performance is, is uh, generalizable to other domains of, yeah. of, of human behavior, right? That, that we ask people to pass judgment over. Yeah. Credit score is a decent one, right? But, but. Yeah, I mean, the, the um... So obviously, because the, the point of the model is to say, you know, when we have a biased decision maker, this could happen, then to begin with, we're fishing for a, an example in which people have this, uh, this type of bias, right? If, um, if, for example, in credit, actually, um, people, uh, 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 priors weren't biased, or perhaps uh, priors were biased, um, for women, and that from a social perspective, we're less concerned about, then it's not going to generalize the, the results. The results are kind of very particular for a context in which we're looking for a, a, a prior that's biased relative to the truth. Um, and so in that sense, um, the claim is not general that this could or that this always happens, but rather than that this could happen. Um, and so I think it's very possible that if we take a different context, um, we'd see something very different in terms of people's priors and then how they uh, use the signal and, and the resulting disparities. Um, I think it's a good question. So we did start um, this experiment. It would have been great to have designed this experiment in a way that it's not just guessing something that is true, but rather a prediction of something in the future that hasn't materialized yet. Yet, I mean, particularly because one of our concerns was that people would just select the assistant. I mean, obviously that's the most rational thing to do. That's our information you have to some extent. It's pretty rational to just select the average that you're given as your assistant. So we were pretty concerned that participants would just kind of adopt the average uh, without kind of using any other information from the profile. And we thought that might be less true if they weren't guessing about something in the past, but rather some kind of prediction, uh, kind of added uncertainty in the future. Um, we wanted to do that. Of course, the difficulty there is slightly more complicated in terms of experimental design because you have to, you can't um, provide participants, and this was done on prolific, you can't provide them um, with their, their payoffs immediately. You have to have whatever it is they're trying to predict materialize and then uh, provide payoffs. So that was their limit there. But I think it's, but I think it is something kind of worth thinking about the extent to which this um, has, uh, plays out differently when you're, when it's a kind of a something closer to classification, like the truth is out there in the world already, you're just trying to guess it versus predicting something that's kind of not true in the world yet. And, and I think that's something actually we have to think about more that we haven't. I'll just um, say mate, one more word about kind of how we selected our covariates. So it was primarily based on the covariates that the other researchers collected when they did the, the test themselves. Um, so we don't have, um, so the only two other covariates that we didn't use was income and race um, that we can consider using as well. Um, we didn't want to do race because we wanted to focus on gender because we thought that particularly, um, this is based mostly on the work of kind of Katie Kaufman at Harvard Business School, who's kind of looked at kind of beliefs when it comes to, to uh, gender performance on math tests. Uh, we thought gender was a good um, 
was a good context, that math scores was a good context for gender. That's kind of why we selected gender and not race in that context. Um, income was the only extra variable that they themselves collected that we haven't used in this experiment. But um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's um, when we initially, before we received that data and we were constructing, so we spent many months kind of um, creating our own math test. <laughs> in fact, we even, um, we even partnered with a, um, with a provider of employment intelligence tests. We wanted to kind of get participants to take mm. this intelligence test and then use mm -hmm. that as the basis of the uh, of the experiment. And, and that's something we're still considering to do. Of course, it's more costly because you have to pay the test takers to create your training data set and then pay another group of um, experimental participants. Um, but that's something potentially we would do. Again, we would hope to go back to your question of how generalizable this is. If people's beliefs are not that women do worse on um, intelligence tests or general uh, ability tests than they actually do, then um, it's our, our model wouldn't predict the effect that we're seeing within the context of math, of math tests. Thanks very much. Um, Dawn, do you have a question from the audience or something, Dawn? You put your hand up. We do. We have two questions here, Karina. Sure. Um, so uh, thank you for the talk. I would really love to connect with you afterwards because I'm doing a project that I think might um, there might be some nice intersections. So I'll send you a follow-up email. But I think the question that I had was picked up a little bit on the last two questions, which is about the kind of real-world validity of the experiment and how well it transfers other contexts. Um, I guess what I was thinking, and I'm not sure how to phrase this, but something like I, when I think of real-world contexts, it's something like a judge who has to make these decisions about um, parole or criminal sentencing or something. Um, the way that that has always been done is by considering a variety of evidence that was available to them. Um, that might come in the form of psychological testing. In some cases, it might come in the form of like neurobiological evidence. In other cases, it's just like past behaviors um, or exactly what the um, crime was, the nature of the, the violence of the offense or something like that. Um, and now on their platter of different sorts of evidence, there's this new kind of evidence it's called algorithmic evidence, let's say, and it comes in the form of a prediction score. So they're really considering like so many varieties of things and it's a more sort of complicated picture in a way. So I'm just wondering like in the experiment that you've created, it seems like the question is really like, here's one piece of evidence, to what extent do you differ from that or vary from that? So I'm just, I'm wondering like, is there a way that you can think of to better construct like the real world circumstance in which a decision maker is confronted with many kinds of competing evidence in cases? I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, so it seems like you're focused on the kind of complex complexity, perhaps that we're we're limiting. We have very few dimensions um, being used, but perhaps in a real world context, it's many, many more dimensions. Of course, the interesting thing about a lot of Bale's um, uh, algorithms, right? There's so many papers that think about um, about um, algorithmic fairness when it comes to Bale algorithms. Most of the time, there's very few, they're not even, I mean, I guess you could say an average is an algorithm, but they're barely like a linear regression, let alone something kind of machine learning. They don't typically have that many, many dimensions. But if you think about that combined with a human decision maker, who's kind of seeing the, the defendant and has kind of many, many dimensions that they're considering and they're assuming that they're engaging in a prediction exercise, um, then, then, the, then the uh, the problem becomes much, much, much more complex than our very simplified context. Um, I'd have to think about how that might impact um, how that might impact our predictions. So, I mean, of course, we do have two um, two treatment arms that um, so so we we vary whether you see gender or not, but we also vary kind of whether that conditional average uses none of the X's, none of the covariates, if it uses age or if it uses age and education. Um, and so that maybe gets a little bit to the complexity question. Obviously, it's moving from zero to one to two. Um, but that's an analysis we haven't done yet um, that um, uh, that we should look more deeply into that, whether the problem becomes a little different when you're considering multiple dimensions. Um, so I think we can get a little bit to that. But I think it is interesting whether... Uh, you know, when it's not just kind of moving from one to two, but in the real world, m moving from uh, kind of very few uh, variables or covariates of features to a lot, whether that's going to change the nature of the decision. Um, and I and I suspect that that there, to some extent, you know, th these this the difficulty of the correlation between these variables and the protected characteristic is going to become more and more complicated. I mean, something that we can even see within our data is that. Um, 
is that, so I think I mentioned that women are much less likely so, to have a, a four-year college degree, um, but they typically kind of, women without a college degree perform as well as men with a college degree. And so an interesting question for us is to what extent are participants using college degree as an indicator of ability in a way that's that's incorrect? And if part of our, uh, our results are related to the fact that they're inferring something about the ability of, uh, of, of men and women on the basis of a college degree when it's kind of more predictive for men and not very predictive um, for women. And that's something you have to work to pass out. I'll mention kind of in, in previous work with Jan, we, we actually find this really interesting and we were quite excited to see that in our preliminary analysis because um, kind of another reason that we've previously written about, about why we we're a skeptical of kind of the exclusion or inclusion of protected characteristics in an algorithm as a way to kind of decrease disparities is exactly for reasons like this, that you have some kind of um, variable that's a very good predictor for one group, but is not very a good predictor for the other group, for the, for the minority group. And if you don't provide information about kind of gender or race, then you're forcing kind of the compression of the prediction to be kind of following the prediction for the, for the majority group, for the larger group rather than the minority group. And so um, that's something we're quite excited to kind of analyze further. Um, but I think your more general question about the complexity is an important one. It's gonna be particularly important as we expand our theory to consider kind of behavioral biases uh, when it comes to uh, Bayesian updating um, that could interact with the results of our model. Thank you. Thanks very much. And that was from Queen of All. Thank you very much. Um, Don, do we have one another one in the boardroom there? Yes, we have Avery Slater here. Avery. Hi. Um, hi. So I just uh, have a kind of open question. Um, you mentioned that one of the places for further thinking would be uh, active debiasing. I just wanted to hear you talk about that a little bit, some of your thoughts on how one might do that. Yeah, so one of the things we, we've been thinking about is that perhaps um, um, if we think about a context in which um, you have a prediction, kind of a, a human machine collaboration, then maybe the, the optimal um, um, prediction function is not a prediction of the thing you are trying to, to learn, the, the why, the label itself, but a prediction of the human error. Um, and so, you know, what you train is some kind of past errors of human decision making and you, you target kind of, hey, human decision maker, this is the typical error made in, in types like this. Like typical error in, type, in situations like this is that you overweight the education for women. For example. Um, and so unlike our context in which we're just imagining you have a prediction function, you either use it automatically or give it to a human decision maker, you actually design what the object of prediction is differently based on if you're trying to kind of whatever measure of decision you're trying to get from the human decision maker. So that's kind of one direction we've been thinking about. But I, I think there's a lot more to think about, but that's kind of one that we've been thinking about and, and we hope to kind of eventually also design an experiment around. Learning from mistakes, that's what we call it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't I didn't see on the slide where you talked about the bias, whether or not the participants had been told about gender or not. I didn't see if the bias was the same for the male group and the female group of participants about performance on the test. Was it the same? I don't know if I missed that part of the data. So you mean the gender of the participants in the experiment? Gender of the participants who were evaluating the gender of a theoretical test taker, right? So I, I, the simple version is, were female participants as biased about female performance as male participants? Um, is that the same? Is it you know, internal bias or? Yes, unfortunately, I we haven't done that analysis yet. I apologize. If this talk was a week later, <laughs> uh, we could have achieved more, so I apologize. But it, eventually it will come out because, yeah, I think that question of kind of in-group bias is, is massively important. Um, and it's something that we definitely want to look at. And as I mentioned before, because we're, we asked about gender kind of after the experiment as well, we're not really concerned that any of that kind of biased our results, but we did collect information about the, the gender of the participants themselves. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that's that's very important, <laughs> and it will be done. Thank you, <laughs> Alexander Bernier. We're back to you. Yeah, um, I want to piggyback off some of the early quest or questions about essentially the experimental design. Um, provided I'm understanding the the way the experiment was constructed correctly, it seems that what's being done is essentially information about uh, fictive, or, or I guess a real, really participants 
performance is being estimated you know, by the, the research participant or subject uh, relative to information about a demographic group, which is sometimes the same one as the person evaluated and sometimes as a wider group that tends to include them. Um, that was basically my understanding of it. I was wondering if other experimental designs had been considered either for you know, the future um, that would involve essentially assessing an individual relative to an indicator of you know, their, either their behavior or their performance um, and conditioned to some uh, you know, indicator of their demographic. So for instance, something along the lines of you know, you're an administrative body, um, here's some information about a person's, whether it's credit worthiness or whether it's their behavior. Um, here's some information about the group they're part of. And then what outcome would you assign them? And th the reason I ask is because it seems to me like a lot of the, you know, the real world issues with some of this body of research is, are, is kind of directed towards, um, you know, they're ones in which a decision maker evaluates or determines outcomes for a person based on their demographic information um so um i think i'm not understanding that the, so the difference is is it related um to this issue of of, of guessing versus predicting or so, is it, yeah so yeah so, so just to speak to that i guess um to to, to make an analogy of it, it, it like I, I guess the sort of context that i i would be thinking about there is things like you know you have to determine if a person's approved for a car loan you have to determine if a person's admitted to college um and you have information, not necessarily about the outcomes of the group they're part of, but of A, some kind of predictor of their own performance, and then B, of the group they're a part of. So I guess really the, you know, the, or, and or like an, an algorithmic, you know, indication of their overall fitness. But I, I guess uh, the distinction would be rather than evaluating, um, you know, basically their expected score, you would be assigning them an outcome. Like I was wondering if there were, you know, any experimental designs that involved assigning people outcomes based on um, information, including possibly their demographic, and then of course some kind of algorithmic score or, or, or other input. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that, that this is something that we did think about a lot because um, because you're right that the structure the structure typically is you have some kind of prediction or you're solving some prediction problem you have some kind of prediction but then that gets translated into a decision and in our experiment we kind of collapse those two things to some extent like the decision itself is the prediction so we don't really get into issues that I think you're right um, um, is um, is very important um, in real world contexts in which it's slightly more complicated, you're using some prediction to make a decision. And so part of what's going on perhaps has to do with some kind of bias in the translation of the prediction to the decision itself. Um, and so, um, 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 and so we, we have to think about this. So we, we have to think of it. So this could, this again could come up with the misalignment of incentives that there's something about kind of the decision, the translation of the prediction for the decision that has some kind of um, different incentive structure than whatever kind of was put into the, to, to the algorithm itself. That's kind of very natural when we think about college admissions. I mean, I don't know how exactly you reduce college decisions to a prediction problem, but let's say you could, um, then it, it it could be that part of the, the the different preferences enter exactly at that stage where you're translating the the um, the prediction into into the decision um, itself. Um, I think part of what we need to do in translating kind of binary decisions, not just the continuous, is also going to be related to this. So I think um, uh, in your examples and very often out uh, decisions are binary decisions; they're not continuous decisions. Maybe credit limit is a, a continuous decision, but typically you make a decision whether to give a loan or not. Um, and so um, the fact that you have a prediction algorithm that's continuous but a decision that's binary also kind of might interact with the different elements of the model. And so, um, yeah, I think that's that's really important and, and kind of requires a little more thought about how that would interact with the predictions of the model. Thanks very much. Christina, can we give the last question to you, please? Oh, I don't know if it's last question worthy, but um, I was curious about whether uh, in your post hoc uh, information gathering, you had investigated the potential for contamination in the sense that the Apple case 
got a lot of press. Um, algorithmic bias is kind of a term people have heard of now. And I didn't know if you had a sense for in your sample, whether people had you know, any salience around that. Yeah, so I, I, I don't quite remember the exact um, wording that we use in the experiment that was approved by the IRB. I'm pretty sure it, it did not include the words in algorithmic bias. Um, I'm pretty sure that it, it kind of was much more general, like we're studying the structure of the relationship between providing an average and a signal and decisions. Um, we worked pretty hard in convincing the IRB that we didn't want any reference to gender in that consent form as well. And so there, there would be some kind of um, uh, debriefing <laughs> that mentioned uh, that mentioned gender. Um, so um, um, I'd have to think about if there were elements of that that would have influenced the decision itself. We, we definitely avoided any kind of reference to algorithmic bias or, or anything like that in, in the consent form. But, but it's definitely this, it was, so, you know, talking again to kind of Katie Kaufman, who I mentioned, who has done quite a lot of research on gender, you know, she she told us if if um, when you ask people very directly, like, guess something for a man, guess something for a woman, people don't want to provide biased answers, right? So when you ask them very directly and when it's very obvious you're comparing the answers for men and women, then you, then you won't kind of get, get any difference. And that was part of our motivation in kind of focusing on this slightly more subtle cue when it comes to gender. Um, but, um, but you know, I guess these things are hard to infer for sure. We, we did um, do quite a lot of um, kind of follow up or not follow up, but ask some questions in the end about the experiment, which turned out to be massively helpful because there was kind of an error or two in our randomization. Um, but we should go over that kind of more carefully. That's what we need to do if we kind of see anything like that, if we get a sense that it was kind of very obvious to, to participants what they what we were asking them and that they wanted to avoid something like a gender bias. Well, I just wonder if you might have some systematic differences. I'm kind of thinking about like, you know, ways will every now and then ask me if I've seen various advertisements and you could maybe ask them if they'd seen various news articles or something like that, where that would be, you know, more salient, um, you know, if they'd taken my class and I've made them go find all sorts of examples of algorithmic bias, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And you think it's specifically kind of the concept of algorithmic bias that might be kind of. Well, especially around like, you know, gender and, you know, because that's just been a big deal with like credit scores and hiring and, and then some of the sentencing types of things have really blown up in the news more than maybe other types of, um, but it's tricky to find like a, a type of bias you could really anticipate so I was just curious if you if that had come out when you spoke to the participants afterwards um so I should mention we, we administered this on prolific so we didn't really directly communicate um with any of the participants um, and but this is great I mean these are the kind of things that you know you you always think that you've thought for months about everything possible but then after you've done the experiment you think of all these other things you could have done I really suspect it's not the last of of kind of these series of experiments so this is super helpful but we did not we didn't do anything of this type and I and I definitely see the value of, of doing that particularly at the end when it's not going to kind of bias the the experimental results in any way so so yeah that's super helpful <laughs> I should talk to you before the experiment next time well I'm, I'm gonna bother you before I run mine <laughs> Talia, I suspect this is not the uh, last time we'll hear about these experiments or this research program, and I, I certainly hope it's not the last time that you come to visit us um, at SRI. So just on behalf of myself and everyone who's visiting, I want to thank you very, very much, not only for um, such a great paper, but, uh, but such a great exchange with all of us. So thanks so kindly for joining us at the school, and I wish you and everybody else a really nice holiday break. Thank you, and thank you so much for all these suggestions and questions and comments. Thank you. Cheers.